American Graduate Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. It's the walk 12 years in the making. I just do what I can. As long as I pass and walk across the stage in May, that's all, that's, that's all I'm here for. And I want my parents and everybody to watch me walk and get my diploma. Pomp, circumstance, and a piece of paper that can set the course for a young future. And I say congratulations to all of you we look forward to brighter and better things from you, and we hope that college is your next step. Have a good day. But a high school diploma eludes many Tennessee students. Those who struggle to speak English take longer to finish if they graduate at all. When you come first time in America, like, when you go to school first time, it's hard for you to understand uh, English. I, I know I, I will graduate, like, if I study hard and do hard, work hard, and I know I believe I will graduate. When the student comes here and can't read in any language at 17, it's, it's just, it's not realistic. It becomes almost impossible to graduate. And we can see that at a, at a sophomore, junior level, because they don't graduate within four years, it's over. The graduation rate for English language learners in Tennessee in 2011 was 70%, compared to 85% for all students. In Nashville, even fewer ELL students graduate. We have over 120 languages in the schools. So we have students coming from all over the world that are relocating here, and many of those students do not speak English so it is a real challenge to educate those students and graduate them within four years. Many just give up. What could have made a difference for you in the schools? Nothing. Nothing. Honestly, nothing. I can't think of one thing that could make a difference. What I do and how I do it now. The challenge of bridging language and cultural gaps to help students graduate is complex and sometimes tangled in politics, especially for students who are undocumented. I want to say that it's possible for undocumented students to graduate from high school and it's possible for undocumented students to go to college, and so many students are doing that now, um, but it is so much harder. It wasn't my choice to, to be here, but since our parents brought me, it was sort of like, they're trying to give me an opportunity to become better, but at the same time, I can't since I wasn't born here, so. So I asked you to tell me about a story that you listened to when you were a child. The, the ugly fox and the little girl. The ugly fox and the little girl. The fox was like hungry and when he saw her, she's a little cute and he wants to eat her, but he couldn't. Oh. Sarnay, yeah. tell me about your story. My story about the fish yes. and he helped the little child, he go and he saw the fish in here and he helped it. Yes. So every culture, no matter if you're from Thailand, China, Iraq, or America, has stories, right? Well, I'm gonna share a story with you today that I loved as a child, and it's called Beauty and the Beast. Fairy tales, acting, and drawing might seem out of place in a high school English class, but teacher Laurie Fouch says she must rely on the basics for these students. I do a lot of body language and acting, <laughs> you know, the best I can, because if they can't understand a word just by saying, stumble. You know, when I was saying the horse stumbled, I kind of show them what it means to stumble. 
um, because I can say trip or fall, and if they don't know those words, it's I'm just saying more words that they don't know. All the students in Vouch's ninth grade class are English language learners, immigrants from other countries. Their ages range from 15 to 18, but the range of their schooling is much broader. It's a mixed group because several of them were educated as children, and then probably four of them were not. They came unschooled. They came to America without prior background in their native language school. So a lot of what I'm teaching is stuff that would be covered in the younger grades. Rutherford County has the third highest number of ELL students in Tennessee. Most were Hispanic until five years ago. That's when an increasing number of Karen families began settling in the area, concentrating near Smyrna High School. And how many chromosomes does the human have? We learned that we can't make the assumption that they have the background knowledge like a lot of the Spanish-speaking students do. So because almost all of the students, probably over 95% of our students were born in refugee camps, until they came to Smyrna, they never participated in an economy, so they have to come here, and we have probably at least 10 students that can't read their first language. One of the Karen students is 17-year-old Serne. He was five when his family fled Myanmar, also called Burma, in Southeast Asia. In Burma, like, it's too dangerous to live there. It's the Burma army like kill people, like Korean people there. That's why we move here. Cernay's family spent 10 years in a Thailand refugee camp before being resettled in Smyrna. At age 15, with no more schooling than a first grader, Cernay was placed in ninth grade at Smyrna High. When I get in school, it was very hard for me, like, to understand the world, me. Like, I had to learn like that very quick, but they have an ESA class. The teacher understands the student for a refugee camp. The teacher uh, like help their ESA class better than a regular class. Smyrna High's approach is called sheltered learning. The students are grouped together, apart from regular classes, for special instruction in certain subjects. Ready? I like to move it, move it. You, don't let me dance by myself. Anybody can dance with me? I use a lot of music. I use some movement with hands. Move it! When are we going to move it? Up or down? Down. Nice. Down. What's this one going to be? Five. Five. Move it. Move it. You got to move it. They don't necessarily have to know the song. It is so surprising how much it will resonate and they'll, they'll remember it with songs. Robert Drake teaches a sheltered math class for Korean students at Smyrna High using any means necessary to bridge the language barrier. What is vertical? Up down, up down, up down. When his best efforts don't work, he calls on one of the more advanced Karen students to help. Show this one. Show this one. If they weren't in sheltered classes, and that's what we used to have, and they weren't in sheltered classes, they didn't achieve because they would fail among the whole population, because they would fall through the cracks. And with a shelter class, we can keep up with them and know where they're at, and we can see them progress and do the work. We're in a good school, so the administration has been able to give us the leeway to try and experiment. And when things didn't go well, we changed it. I know that the four-year model is causing a lot of concern, because if we had five years, we could take that year and focus on some of the basic needs that the students have. So right, right now the system doesn't accommodate for a year to learn how to add and learn the alphabet. In Tennessee, the way graduation rates are calculated changed in 2011. The new standards model federal guidelines by lowering the time allowed for a student to graduate from five years and up to age 22 to four years up to age 18. Under the tougher standards, many Tennessee school districts saw their graduation rates plummet. In Nashville Public Schools, the graduation rate went from more than 82 percent to 76 percent. And there's a wide gap between the grad rate for English language learners and that of other students. School district officials don't hide their frustration. 
I'm disappointed in the graduation rate in this respect. The standard changed from count measuring graduation rate on a five-year basis to a four-year basis. We graduate a lot of kids between four and five years. Uh, we have programs that are designed to do that, and, and so we feel like that's a false uh, fail, if you will. We have a number of students who need that fifth year, particularly English learners, but also students with disabilities. The number of English language learners in Nashville Public Schools is startling. About 9,500 students speaking 135 different languages. Their impact is so great, it consumed the conversation at a teacher town hall hosted by NPT in February. They have to be literate in their native language. If you don't know the concept of a planet, that's a concept, that's mm -hmm. not just a word. If you don't know the concept of a planet, then learning the word does nothing for you. We are pushing them out the door to get those graduation rates, but these, these students do not read, they cannot critically think, and they don't have 21st century skills, but we're forced to send them on their way. And some of them have been born and raised in the U.S., but their parents still don't speak English. So when I call home to say that he's not doing anything, the parents don't understand what I'm saying. How do you teach a, a child who speaks a language other than English? How do you teach Many them? new teachers are not prepared for the complexity of educating ELL students. If you don't know your partner, I want you to introduce yourself and talk to your partner about what experience you have working with English learners. Go! Every new Nashville school teacher gets a crash course about ELL students before heading to the classroom. Deanna Kahn, ELL specialist for Nashville Public Schools, leads the discussion. An immigrant does not equal an English learner, and an English learner does not necessarily equal an immigrant. And so um, teachers, what they really need to know is who are the English learners? Who are the students that are not proficient in English? Some students, it's very clear that they're not proficient in English. When they come into the classroom, they might not know how to speak to the teacher or speak to other students. For those students, teachers need strategies for really reaching them because they have very specific needs about teaching them how to talk about the content. And then there's the other category of students who come into the classroom speaking very well and they sort of sneak by teachers and teachers don't realize that really academically, they're not academically proficient. Nobody at the school knows me. Y'all don't know me even though I'm telling you this. The real me, nobody knows. Mario Suarez has mastered the process of sneaking under the academic radar in school. I'm respectful towards adults. I don't talk back to, uh, to adults until they say something aggressive to me or talk back to me. I don't just come up out of nowhere and just blurt out, just start screaming like other kids do and just get into all kinds of trouble. That's not me. I'd rather keep my stuff low and not talk about it. The result? Suarez is 17 years old and repeating ninth grade for the third time. I'm probably going to drop out next year. I'm supposed to have 17 credits to drop out under 18, but when I turn 18, I can drop out. So I come back to either get my 17 credits and drop out, or I just come back to just fool around one more year, and then next year I'll be out. Suarez says he once was a good student until middle school. That's when his race and immigrant background began creating conflict with some other students. You call me a Mexican, I'm fighting. You call me a wetback, I'm fighting. You call me a beaner, I'm fighting. And that's really what I think got me off track, was the new school building and middle school and all that. But after the fourth grade, everything went shh, downhill. Suarez was born in Honduras. At age six, he immigrated to the United States with his family bringing with him some of the worst childhood memories. I don't saw about six people get killed in my face in Honduras growing up. And I've seen plenty of guns put to my head. And that's just scary. It's real scary. And I believe that when you're that young and you see something that horrifying, it ain't going to be that easy to forget. And it really hasn't been. Suarez has moved beyond English language learner, but he's hampered by his social experiences before arriving in this country. Many immigrant students come from lands where violence, political upheaval, and poverty are rampant. Even students a generation removed from that trauma can struggle because of it. Yeah, I went through some tough times, but I know people who went through a lot worse. And I think that's what factors in with, with their beliefs, is if they've gone through tougher stuff.
Mario Rosales is also a student at Pearl Cohn High. He has a lot in common with Suarez. Both Marios are from immigrant families and Hispanic heritage. They live in the same West Nashville neighborhood, and sometimes they even hang out together. Or I got more of like their back. <laughs> I ain't, ain't going to let nothing happen to them out here. For yeah. all their similarities, these boys are clearly on different paths to adulthood. I'm awful compared to them. I wouldn't say that. No, I'm awful. People got their ups and downs, but no one's awful. I stay down, though. I don't ever get my grades up. I don't do nothing in class. At least they do something in class. I don't do nothing. I usually make A's and B's, mostly A's. I'm thinking about becoming a cardiac surgeon or an ER doctor. Rosales is determined to graduate from high school, even though he still has a hard time with English and is often stereotyped because of his ethnic background. They'll assume that I wasn't born in the U.S. They'll ask me, were you born in the U.S.? Was English a second language? No, it wasn't. I was born in the U.S. and English was my first language. Just have a hard time. Under pressure and just school overall. Don't help me with simple English words and try to help me the, the basis of English. No, help me with what I need to be helped with. I'm just a regular person. I'm a regular kid like the rest of these people. While Rosales challenges educators who label him, Suarez admits he does not. He explains how he tried to step up his schoolwork last year by applying for an internship, like the other Mario. He says this is what a teacher told him. I wouldn't even fill that out if I were you. And I was like, why? She said, because you ain't even going to get looked at. And I was like, oh, I just left it there. So now I was, I was thinking about it when I went back to class, and I was like, well, if I would have had good grades and would have gotten in trouble, maybe I could have done it. Because honestly, if I really did my work in school, I could get some good grades. Because I know, I know stuff that my mom is impressed by the stuff I know sometimes. Why do some immigrant and ELL students excel while others with similar stories fail? Vanderbilt researchers are looking for answers. There have been a lot of hypotheses out there that if you're an English language learner, that's condemning you to some sort of high school dropout status. It's condemning you to an educational trajectory that really is one that we don't expect for other children. So what we're trying to show here is that college access is as much of a reality, can be as much of a reality for this population than, than your non-English language learner student. Dr. Stella Flores is a professor at Vanderbilt's Peabody College who studies high school achievement and college access among English language learners. The infrastructure for dealing with immigrants, for being responsive to immigrant families, and especially in the schools, and especially immigrants who speak a different language, is not quite as established as it is in other states. Add to that a very anti-immigrant environment in which the families must live and work, you know, it becomes a little harder for the two to come together in the sense the parents understanding what structures to use, that it's okay to use them, versus the school responding to these populations. This meeting at Salah Hadin, a Kurdish community center in Nashville, is an effort to improve understanding between parents and school officials, especially around cultural and religious expectations. What can we do together to make it better for them? How can we be more involved in their education and visit their schools? The communication gap between immigrant parents and schools often leaves students navigating two different cultures while trying to meet academic standards and in some cases learn a new language. You feel different. You know you're different when you go to school and you see other people, other races, other ethnic groups. And when you come home, like, it's all a different story. Like at home, you might speak Kurdish and English. Sometimes it like mix it and you go back to uh, school. So your mind gets a little mixed up. I couldn't even like walk down the hallways and they would scream at me, tuck in your shirt, tuck in your shirt. And I would tell them I have a slip from the office. I, I don't have to tuck in my shirt because of some religious facts. And they would send me to ISS. They would get, scream at me. And I would always win the case because I had an office note, but the way that they were treating me. And then whenever something else, when we go to the lunch line, the lunch ladies, they get kind of tired of all the questions that we ask because, for example, the Muslims, they ask, we can't eat pork, is this pork? The Indians, they say, we can't eat beef, is this beef? So um, the lunch ladies, they get real annoyed. Complicating all this is the belief in some cultures that parents are not to interfere, get involved, or even show up at school. As soon as kids are in middle schools, it's much more difficult to be involved. 
What would you say to parents who want to be involved? How can they be involved? We know that not all schools in our system are welcoming and supportive of families. This is something that we're working very hard on right now. This was the first time high-ranking Nashville school officials accepted an invitation to meet with Kurdish parents at their mosque and answer some tough questions. Diversity is great for many reasons, and you mentioned that we have about 135 languages. How equipped are our teachers and faculties to handle this type of diversity? There are many more cultures than there are races uh, in our school system, and we have to recognize that, and I think it's very important that we look at cultural awareness and diversity training across all of our schools. In 2012, one in eight students in Nashville public schools were English language learners, the largest percentage of any school district in Tennessee. According to the state's annual report card, the district is making progress in educating ELL students, showing gradual improvements in test scores. Ironically, as more of these students succeed in school, some are learning a hard lesson about the promise of a high school diploma. It's under my desk, still tucked away. It's not up on my wall or anything. It's just, I guess, a reminder, once again, of what could have been. Meet Marisol Miranda, valedictorian class of 2011 at Hunters Lane High School in Nashville. Her story represents the dream of many immigrants. She came to the United States at age eight with her parents, brother and sister illegally from Mexico. Adapting to the environment, to the kids around me, to the language, yeah, to the culture. I just had gotten out of ESL, so I don't think anyone was expecting me to do well or better than most. She made nearly all A's, and by high school, Marisol was in advanced placement classes, president of the Honor Society, and at the top of her class. And now, I don't really remember much. I just remember thanking my parents in Spanish for everything they've done for me. And thanking my teachers and my fellow students. I just wanted people to enjoy that day, you know? It was joy short-lived. Marisol is still undocumented. So while she received several college scholarship offers, they don't cover all expenses. Her family can't afford to help, and without legal citizenship, Marisol cannot apply for financial aid. Her diploma represents dreams unfulfilled for the whole family. It's important for my children's education, for your life, for good life, for the future. I see every time she's sad, depression, this is me too, oh my God, this is Terrible. I mean, it was just sad, you know, because a lot of things could have been, but because of certain documents, I couldn't. Stories like Marisol's discourage many undocumented students from staying in school and getting a high school diploma. Even with my brother, he's like, I'm not going to go to college. Why should I pay attention or go to school or anything like that? Besides stigma and lack of incentive, undocumented students face threats of arrest and deportation, according to Amelia Post with Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. Our education committees here in our state legislature were discussing checking immigration status in schools because they said these students don't matter, these students are criminals, we don't value them. And so the message that that sends, even if that policy doesn't pass, the fear and the negativity that it creates has a real impact. And we hear that from students who are six years old, five years old, seven years old. This year we collected letters from students of all grade levels to bring to the state legislature. And we were hearing from young, young students about they felt like they weren't welcome in the state. They felt like they were discriminated against. And some of these students were students with papers, but they saw how their parents were treated or how their siblings were treated. Marisol now places her hope for going to college in legal possibilities, like the DREAM Act, or her mother's effort to complete the long process of applying for U.S. citizenship, which would automatically transfer to Marisol. I hope I just have a better future. I mean, if my parents could come to the United States, 
work jobs and get me a house, a car. I mean, I hope, I sure hope I can someday go to college and do better for myself. Marisol has already done better than many ELL and immigrant students. Helping more of them to earn diplomas will take resources and strategies beyond the students' own abilities. There's incredibly well-intentioned, um, hard-working teachers who want to support their students and just don't know how. We get calls all the time from teachers from all over the state who say, I have this great student and what can I do? Or I have this class of students and I need resources, you know? And so I think a lot of times it's about having that training, those resources, that knowledge. I just asked him, what can we do to help him? And you said? Nothing. If he asked you that question like two years ago, what do you think you would have said? Nothing. What about three years ago? <laughs> Nothing. I don't know your life, but I certainly know what your potential is and what kind of person you are. So my job is help you. you know, help you get to where you want to go. Yeah, a lot of people try to help me out except their bodies. Okay. When students drop out, we all pay a price. According to the Alliance for Excellent Education, dropouts earn about $10,000 less per year than high school graduates. They pay fewer taxes, are more likely to be on welfare, and more than three times as likely to be arrested. I already know where I'm gonna be in a couple of years. I've been there. Tell me. Juvenile jail. I know where I'm gonna end up. I know my consequence. I know what I'm getting into. We lose a large amount, actually, in eighth grade, right? That's the silent secret we don't talk about. They disappear from the databases. So when our national surveys, for example, start to look at students at 10th grade, you've lost about 40% of the minority population in terms of black and Latino students. So I think these programs are starting them early in middle school. Some programs are in the works in Nashville Public Schools. An early warning data system now helps identify students at risk of dropping out. And a new middle school bridge program offers students a place to catch up and stay on track to high school. The district is also working on a diversity plan to be rolled out in 2013. But it's more challenging to find an approach that works for older ELL students who never set foot in a classroom until high school. If I graduate high school, like I will go to college, and after college, like I will help people, like stuff like that, like, you know, interpreter, people, like help people that move here. It doesn't matter where they're from, what they know, this school is affected and all of us are affected by they're here and they need to take the test. So I want them to do well and I want them to succeed and graduate. It's a goal that, when translated across cultures, can help bring communities and generations together. My mom couldn't go to school and my dad only finished high school, so they think that, oh, so I'll be the first one to finish high school in my um, family and go to college. So they are very excited and very, very supportive of me. We have children from all races in our school system and many cultures in our school system, and that is continuing to increase. We want every one of them to graduate from high school. We want every one of them to be able to go on to further education, to find good jobs, and to continue to represent a very important part of the economic development of our community and of our country. American Graduate Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.